Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History. As we talk today about a third major wave of immigration to the United States in the late 18, early 1900s, and how it contributed to the growth of cities in America. Now, the United States has always been a nation of immigrants, unless you are part of that less than 1% of the U.S. population who is an American Indian, your ancestors came here from somewhere else within the past 500 years. But at different points in our history, um, immigrants have tended to come um, from various parts of the world. Of course, in the 1840s and 1850s um, and the 1860s, many immigrants came to America from Ireland and from Germany. Um, but starting in the 1870s and lasting up uh, into World War I, many more began coming from Scandinavia or from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, although certainly quite a few continued to come from Germany and Ireland uh, and elsewhere. And on the West Coast, many also came from East Asia, particularly China, although a growing number were coming from Japan. Um, unlike most of the German immigrants and um, some of the Irish immigrants, who are not now known in some cases as the old immigrants, um, many of these new immigrants were poor and unskilled, in great contrast to most of the Germans who would come. Many were also Catholic uh, or Jewish at a time when most Americans were Protestant and distrusted Catholics and disliked Jews. And so this, um, this big religious difference added to the fears that American culture would be changed or destroyed by these new immigrants, which led to even greater discrimination against them, even by the old immigrants who'd come just a few decades before. Um, immigrants came to America for many reasons. Falling farm prices in Europe made their old agricultural lifestyles unprofitable. Likewise, factory work in America often paid better than factory work in Europe. And religious persecution pushed some of them out of Europe, particularly Jews in the Russian Empire. Jews may have faced prejudice in the United States, but in Russia the army would sometimes come in and destroy entire villages for practice or for fun. America offered jobs and offered land. The Homestead Act of 1862 had made western land cheap, and railroads made it easy to get to. In fact, many railroads offered deliberately cheap fares west, um, so they would later have customers for the products they shipped across the country. America also offered political and religious freedom. Once immigrants came to America, they often wrote to family and friends back home, so people from the same family or town would end up in the same town or neighborhood in America. Creating ethnic neighborhoods, Chinatowns and Japan towns, Little Italy's, Little Poland's, Hispanic neighborhoods, sometimes called barrios, uh, and other ethnic neighborhoods too. Indeed, as Southerners uh, migrated north, looking for work outside the impoverished, um, semi-reconstructed South, um, uh, neighborhoods of Appalachian Americans and other Southerners developed in some neighborhoods in northern cities too. And these various neighborhoods um, immigrant groups maintain their culture um, for a generation or two, and some ways, of course, long beyond that. In other cases, entire villages would pack up and move to America, sometimes founding an entirely new village on the same um, street map as their old one. This was particularly common in Scandinavia. Now, <clears throat> when immigrants arrived in America, they had to be inspected to make sure they were healthy, that they had money, um, or a skill, or at least someone in America who could support them. Um, first and second class passengers were usually processed right on board the ship and could um, disembark within a matter of minutes um, as soon as the paperwork could be filed. Third class passengers, though, were often taken to special facilities for health inspections and further questioning, like, are you a communist? Most European immigrants entered the United States through Ellis Island off the coast of New York City. Um, most Asian immigrants landed at, at Angel Island um, in, near San Francisco. Um, and there the, processing was, uh, <coughs> there the processing was a bit less friendly. Uh, on Ellis Island, um, about 98% of immigrants were admitted to the United States. 
although again, the health inspection could be uncomfortable and embarrassing, um, it was not uncommon for foreign names to be misspelled or shortened or changed. Some Eastern European names are made up almost entirely of consonants. It's a whole lot easier to call somebody Smith. On the other hand, um, for Asian immigrants in Angel Island, especially the Chinese, but the Japanese as well, um, they might be held for weeks or months, um, essentially as prisoners behind fences in little tent cities. Um, by 1890, about 40 percent of the people in San Francisco, about 40 percent of those in Chicago, were foreign born. About 80 percent of those in New York City had been born in another country. And to help them with the process of Americanization, settlement houses were created in many big cities. Um, to help immigrants from Europe and also immigrants from rural areas to big cities learn to fit in, to give them a place to live, a place to eat, you need to teach them to dress and speak uh, and act like Americans. Um, one of the most famous of these settlement houses was Hull House in Chicago, founded by Jane Addams. <coughs> and indeed, many of the people working in settlement houses were women. At a time when middle class women were getting more and more education, but when it was still socially unacceptable for women to work outside the home, uh, in most circumstances, one of the few socially acceptable ways to do something outside the home um, was charitable work, and settlement houses were seen as falling into that category. So many young women would work in a settlement house for a few years before settling down and becoming a good wife and mother in the cult of domesticity. Others, like Jane Addams, devoted their entire lives to settlement houses and other um, political reform movements. Um, now, as more and more immigrants entered the country, an, um, a new wave of nativism broke out in America. Nativists, of course, hoped to limit immigration and the rights of immigrants, um, just as some had tried to do in the 1840s and especially 1850s. Um, some of the earliest laws against teaching religion in public schools were passed by Protestants to try to shut down Catholic schools, which they saw as in trying to preserve an un-American, un-Christian culture in the United States. On the West Coast, prejudice against the yellow peril of low-paid Chinese workers led to Congress passing the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 which outlawed immigration by Chinese workers, or even the return of those who went overseas to visit their homeland in China. And it limited the rights of Chinese Americans born in America. Um, the Supreme Court did eventually rule that Chinese Americans born in America were citizens and had equal rights. The United States versus Wong Kim Ark in 1898, being a U.S. Supreme Court case, it declared the 14th Amendment did mean that almost anyone born in the United States, even if they were from um, Chinese immigrant ancestry, were U.S. citizens. And in theory had equal rights, but again, they were still often discriminated against. Still, as more and more immigrant workers joined labor unions, um, unions began to demand better treatment for immigrants, but assimilation remained a slow process. And while some immigrants went west um, to start farms of their own, particularly um, Scandinavian and uh, Eastern European immigrants, most um, settled in big cities. And America certainly had big cities by the late 1800s. In 1860, just 16 percent of Americans lived in a town or city of 8,000 people or more. By 1900, over 30 percent lived in towns and cities. A process known as urbanization, um, made possible by things such as steel frame construction and development of the safety elevator, both of which contributed to the building um, of tall buildings, even skyscrapers. The home insurance company building in Chicago often being considered the first skyscraper. Um, of course, the early major cities were mostly in the Northeast. Um, later along Midwestern rivers or on the Pacific coast. Railroads made travel to and between cities easier. The growth of industry, which mostly took place near cities to take advantage of their population, 
led to more people moving to cities for work and a greater variety of work than what they could do in the countryside. And besides inventions like steel frame construction and the safety elevator, other inventions um, made urban living more practical as well. Mass transit became widespread in the late 1800s. Horse-drawn streetcars had existed for some time. In 1888, Richmond, Virginia introduced the first electric-powered streetcar. Cable cars, and in some places even subways, were built to make movement within cities easier, um, <coughs> including movement from the suburbs to the downtowns of cities. Um, and people who could afford to take mass transit might take it every day um, from the outskirts of the city to the city center. Um, which meant that increasingly people separated where they lived based on social class and income. Traditionally, almost everybody had lived jumbled more or less together. The working class, the middle class, and even the upper class living most of the time within a few streets of each other. Um, except when the truly wealthy would um, escape to their country estates or the middle class to their country clubs. But now as transportation became easier, people segregated themselves more and more by income levels. Um, meaning that the inner cities um, often ended up um, the province of poor working class people, often crammed into crowded tenements. Um, often dark, often poorly maintained. Um, eventually, some safety laws and other standards were passed, requiring, for example, a minimum number of windows and bathrooms, but these were often um, pretty unpleasant places to live. Um, indeed, overcrowding in cities led to the spread of disease and crime, as fighting between gangs based on ethnic groups or workplace affiliation. Um, were common in some neighborhoods. There were um, disasters due to the fact that a tenement that caught on fire could kill hundreds of people, or a fire in a big city um, could spread through the whole area, um, such as the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which killed somewhere between 200 and 300 people and left over 100,000 homeless. Now, in the late 1800s, more and more cities were creating more professional public services. Public utilities were created in many big cities, um, run by the government to, at least in theory, make sure people got running water and possibly electricity or natural gas, uh, <coughs> even in places where their people were not rich enough for private utility companies to make a profit. Um, cities began to develop professional police forces, and up until the 1800s, um, in most cases, uh, law enforcement was done by a sheriff who might deputize local men um, to, uh, to catch criminals. Um, indeed, if you saw someone committing a crime, you were supposed to simply shout out what's called raising a hue and cry, and everybody was meant to swoop down and try to stop that. But the professional police forces were supposed to make things more orderly, more rational, um, although they often became tools of politicians themselves. In New York City in the 1850s, there was even a fight between uh, a city-run police force and a new police force created by the state uh, to police and replace the city-run police force. Likewise, cities began to found professional fire departments. And for much of history, if a fire broke out, everybody grabbed a bucket and tried to throw water on it. Some insurance companies had their own fire departments, and there were volunteer fire departments in some places, which sometimes fought with each other, much like gangs, for the honor of being the first to put out a fire. But fire departments were professionalized in the late 1800s as well. And cities began to build public parks to give even poor people an escape um, from the crowded urban setting to something that at least resembled the great outdoors. Still, poverty, pollution, and crime remain serious problems into the 20th century. Um, in the mid-1800s and afterwards, um, as an outgrowth of the Second Great Awakening, religious groups tried to help the working class. The Young Men's Christian Association was founded in London in 1844, um, but later spread to the United States. 
Their original purpose was to provide housing for young men moving from the countryside to the city um, so they would have a wholesome place to stay in big cities and not be corrupted by the bad habits um, of wicked city life. The Young Women's Christian Association was founded in 1855 um, for much the same purpose. Both groups provided a place to live, but also education based on Bible study. Um, but other areas too. They eventually created colleges. Um, and the YMCA also um, emphasized health and fitness. Um, basketball was invented by James Naismith. While, uh, while at the Young Men's Christian Association International Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts, now simply known as Springfield College. Volleyball was invented by YMCA Athletic Director William Morgan in the late 1800s as well. In 1865, the Salvation Army was founded in England, although it didn't actually take on that name um, until 1878. Uh, it was founded by William Booth, a Methodist minister, and his wife, Catherine Booth. In fact, the Salvation Army became one of the first, um, one of the first um, modern major Christian groups to allow women to preach as equals with men. Um, they based their hymns on popular songs, often drinking songs, with new religious lyrics. Um, and the Salvation Army became famous for its bands as they would play outside bars um, and with religious words to tunes all the drunks already knew. And they hoped to minister to the poor and the needy, with whom many well-to-do Christians didn't want to have any contact. The Salvation Army said their three S's were soup, soap, and salvation. Um, feed people first and clean them up, and only then try to save their souls once you've proved that you really meant the Christian love that you preached. And to help the dregs of society, the Salvation Army created homeless shelters at a time when most people were perfectly satisfied to see the poor starve, or more likely not see them starve, um, as rich and poor and middle class no longer lived side by side. And because the drunks, drug addicts, prostitutes, and other wretches whom the Salvation Army tried to save were often not welcome in mainstream churches, the Salvation Army became essentially its own church, distinguishable by the uniforms its officers wore. In 1880, the Salvation Army spread to the United States and gained a lot of respect in the early 1900s um, as they went into disaster areas, for example, to help people left homeless by the great Galveston hurricane of 1900, the deadliest natural disaster in American history, killing between 6,000 and 12,000 people. Following the great San Francisco fire of 1906, um, um, which was made worse by uh, the earthquake that started it, breaking the water lines that would have let the fire department pump water onto the fire. The Salvation Army helped out the homeless in San Francisco as well. Um, and while there were many unskilled workers, um, even they increasingly needed education to be able to read um, signs, for example, and follow written directions. Um, and so um, the need to educate people led to the development of public schools. While there had been public schools throughout the country since the early 1800s, in some ways since the 1600s in New England, they weren't common um, in most parts of America, especially in the South. And furthermore, schools were not especially professional. Teachers tended to be young men um, working um, for a couple years until they found a real job, or young women working for a couple years until they got married and started a real life. But the idea developed in this age of professionalization that even teachers should be professional. And normal schools, teachers training colleges, um, typically two-year institutions, began to be created in the United States, in beginning in New England, but spreading to the whole country, um, even the South. Of course, in 1911, East Tennessee State Normal School opened in Johnson City, Tennessee, now, of course, East Tennessee State University. Um, teachers' colleges opened elsewhere, too, in Tennessee, what are now Middle Tennessee State University, Memphis University, um, 
and Tennessee State University. Um, opened in 1911 and 1912 too. Tennessee State University being meant to train black teachers for the colored schools in Tennessee, making it one of the very few publicly supported black schools um, in the South. Um, some, and so just as schools began preparing students for college, other schools prepared them for agricultural or craft work. In 1881, Booker T. Washington, founded the Tuskegee Institute in uh, Alabama to teach trades to African Americans, feeling they could only win political equality and social equality after they had earned economic equality through their own labor. So for both the working class and the middle class, education even became a form of entertainment. In 1874, Methodist minister John Hale Vincent and businessman Lewis Miller founded a training camp at, um, for Sunday school teachers at a campsite on the shores of Chautauqua Lake in New York State. But pretty soon it became popular for entire families to go to the Chautauqua um, facility and other camps built like it. Um, for people who had no Chautauqua camp near them, um, traveling Chautauquas began to spread. Um, and some Chautauqua um, camps had lecture halls, libraries, dining halls, parks, and theaters. Again, usually out in the country, but close to a town with good rail connections. Again, some traveled the country, um, setting up tents and stages um, with lecturers on um, religious topics, history, um, uh, literature, politics, and more. Music was also common, almost like a traveling circus of education. Um, the forerunner, perhaps, of the Discovery Channel or the History Channel, education as entertainment. Theodore Roosevelt once said Chautauquas were the most American thing about America.